Having natural charm can be a gift, but when someone with a questionable nature is graced with it and it's blended with the training of a soldier, it could be dangerous and even fatal. I'm John Lorden, and in today's special Solved episode, we're looking at a historical case and how police stopped a man that would have likely become or might actually be a serial killer. This is the seriously mysterious story of the truth in Neville Heath. Neville Heath was born in Essex, England on June 6, 1917. His parents were William, a barber, and Bessie Heath. In 1920, a second son was born, but while still an infant, the child contracted tuberculosis and passed away. This might have had some impact on Neville. He became troublesome, often caught shoplifting. William and Bessie had a third son in 1928 and enrolled Neville into Rutlish Grammar School in London. Rutlish had a reputation for strong discipline, something that William and Bessie felt that the boy needed. Neville soon found himself physically punished for almost any infraction. Nevertheless, Neville adapted his behavior and he was noted by his teachers to be a charming and intelligent boy. During his time there, he noticed that most of his fellow students were from far more affluent families and he took on their mannerisms and a more refined upper class speech. This may be the only positive influence he actually received from the school and these refinements only augmented his ability to lie his way convincingly and charmingly out of his future troubles. He became obsessed with acquiring a more wealthy lifestyle, but by no means did he intend to come by it honestly. It is also around this time that Neville learned the art of violence. At 15 years old, he attended a party where he found the opportunity to meet girls. Instead of putting his charms to good use, Neville began assaulting a girl at the party. Fortunately, other partygoers heard her screams and they intervened. Neville was kicked out and confronted by the girl's father the following day. The outraged father threatened to report Neville's behavior to the school and to the police, but Neville again applied his charm, apologizing for his actions, and professed that he had never had alcohol before and he didn't realize what he was doing. Somehow, this worked, and Neville talked the man out of reporting him. Neville Heath eventually failed his exams at school and was dismissed. He joined the Royal Air Force in 1935. It was a perfect choice in Neville's view. He had a preoccupation with airplanes and found that military pilots gathered the most appealing attention from civilians, primarily from young women. In the RAF, he lied continuously about his family status and his level of academic achievement, which helped him grift others. He took to drinking in pubs and lying to the masses there. He passed bad checks, engaged in petty thefts, and did whatever he could to gain status in the eyes of others. RAF authorities caught on to him, and he was put under detention for punishment. However, his deviant nature came into play again. He broke out of the base to go home. He was charged with absent without leave or AWOL status and car theft. He would be drummed out of the RAF in September of 1937, and again seemed to learn nothing from this lesson. He moved to Nottingham and took on the alias of Lord Dudley and continued with the facade of a young man from a wealthy family. He committed more fraud and theft during this time and was arrested when he attempted to purchase an expensive automobile with yet another bad check. At his trial, he applied that charm yet again, pleading for the court's mercy, which he got. By this time, it was 1938, and Neville moved to London. He was caught trying to pawn stolen jewelry and arrested again. Despite his charms, he was placed in a detention center for youths with a three-year sentence. In 1939, the Second World War arrived, and in 1941, fresh out of his detention center, Neville attempted to rejoin the RAF, but he was denied. Begrudgingly, he joined the Royal Army Service Corps and was sent to the Middle East as an infantryman. He quickly found himself in trouble again, engaging in fraud and theft. He was found with the identification of another soldier, apparently to collect his pay as well as his own. He was court-martialed and placed on a ship that would take him home, but he escaped custody when the ship came to port in South Africa. So what did he do? He decided to join the South African Air Force using the name James Armstrong. He engaged in combat operations and continued in his dishonest ways. He would tell anyone that would listen grand stories of his aristocratic family and lavish lifestyle back home in Britain. Eventually, he met a 22-year-old Southern African woman 
who was from a wealthy family. Elizabeth Rivers was smitten, and they were married within a year's time. They had a child together, but his true identity was eventually discovered, along with the fact that he was a fugitive from the RASC. It was found that he had even been wearing medals that were never issued to him. The SAAF went about proceedings to remove him from service and proposed the idea of shipping him back home to England. Somehow, Neville Heath or James Armstrong or whoever he was at the time managed to talk himself out of trouble yet again, insisting that he had settled down, married, and had a child. Shockingly, the SAAF even kept him on. As he continued to serve as SAAF pilot Captain James Armstrong, he also petitioned the RAF to accept him yet again, of course, using yet another name. And he was accepted. He left South Africa and his family and returned to Britain to serve as a bomber crewman. He even received honors for saving many of his crewmates from a shot down aircraft. Sometime later, however, Neville was caught again for wearing medals that he hadn't earned. His true identity was eventually uncovered and he was discharged from the RAF. He tried to return to Elizabeth in South Africa, but he discovered that she had filed for divorce on the grounds of his desertion. There was no charming his way back in with his South African wife, so he returned to England. Neville met a woman in February of 1946 by the name of Paula Breeze, and he was able to convince her to take a room with him at the Strand Palace Hotel. According to her statement, she had fallen asleep and woke up in the middle of the night with her hands and feet bound. Neville was standing over her and began his assault. She screamed repeatedly until Neville knocked her unconscious. Fortunately, she had already made enough of a ruckus. Hotel staff came into the room and they put a halt to his torture and quite possibly a murder in progress. Staff detained him until the police arrived, but Paula refused to press charges, and he again got away with it. Neville Heath was free to roam the streets of London and its surrounding boroughs further. Yvonne Simons, a 19-year-old woman from Chelsea, England, met Neville Heath that June of 1946 and was quite attracted to the man that had represented himself to her as a lieutenant colonel in the RAF. In what must have appeared to Yvonne as a whirlwind romance, she agreed to marry Neville and the two checked into the Pembridge Court Hotel in London. Neville had presented Yvonne as his wife in the registry. There were no incidents of violence that night and Yvonne left Neville the following morning to return to her home in Worthing and inform her parents of her engagement to the RAF Lieutenant Colonel. Neville remained in the room for a few days and promised to follow Yvonne soon. On the morning of June 21st, police were called to the Pembridge Court Hotel. A woman, soon after identified as Marjorie Gardner, a 32-year-old mother, part-time movie extra, and artist, was found lying in the bed and covered with a blanket up to her neck. She was dead, found with her ankles bound by rope and burn marks from rope that had once been on her wrists. She had 17 deep whip marks on her back with a unique diamond pattern and was brutalized in other ways far too graphic to describe here. Keith Simpson, a forensic pathologist, determined that she had been suffocated likely by the pillow and all of the injuries found on her person had been received while she was still alive. Yet no one heard her screams, or at least no one that had come forward to admit to it. It seemed likely that she may have been gagged. Simpson identified the diamond pattern as that of a leather riding crop, and he has been quoted as saying, Find that riding crop, and you've found your killer. Police focused on the man who had taken the room on June the 16th, that being Neville Heath himself. They located witnesses from a nearby theater, the Club Panama, who stated that they saw a man and woman matching the descriptions of Neville and Marjorie the night before the woman's murder. The couple appeared to be enjoying each other's company very much, and both were drinking heavily and left the establishment sometime past midnight. From his identity taken from the room's registration and the physical description from witnesses, police distributed his picture amongst the local law enforcement agencies, but only Neville Heath's name ended up in the newspapers in connection with Marjorie's murder. True to his word, to Yvonne, at least for that moment, Heath took off from the London Hotel and met her parents at their home in Worthing. When the news of the murder was discovered, Neville played innocent claiming that another man had joined Marjorie and that Neville lent the couple his room key. He said that he knew nothing about the body found there and had checked out of the room that morning. 
he was committed to that story enough, at least in front of Yvonne and her parents, to write a letter to Superintendent Tom Barrett of the London police, proclaiming his innocence. The letter further stated that he was in possession of that leather riding crop, but it must have been used by the key borrower and that he would surrender it to the police. Neville mailed the letter and left the Simons' home, indicating that he was heading to London to give whatever help he could to the police. Instead, Neville traveled to Bournemouth and checked into the Tollard Royal Hotel. He assumed the persona of Group Captain Rupert Brooke. Bournemouth seemed a good place to blend in as much of the town and surrounding area hotels and inns were still being used as billets, a community to house British troops. Neville camouflaged himself within this gathering of military men and women, and some 10 days into his stay, on July 3rd, he met Doreen Marshall, a 21-year-old, freshly discharged member of the Women's Royal Navy Service. She had been staying for some time in a nearby hotel, the Norfolk, to recover from influenza and measles. Doreen was quickly won over by the man calling himself Group Captain Rupert Brooke, and they shared afternoon tea. She accepted his dinner invitation to the Tollard Royal that evening. After dinner, the pair moved to the lounge for drinks. During this interaction, the normally suave Neville must have said something that made Doreen uneasy. She attempted to put an end to the evening, asking another guest to call her a taxi. The false Rupert insisted that he would walk her to the Norfolk Hotel, and to this Doreen agreed. That decision would prove fatal to the young World War II veteran. On July 5th, the manager of the Norfolk Hotel phoned the Tollard Royal and asked if anyone had seen his missing guest. The manager of the Tollard did recall seeing Miss Marshall on the night of the 3rd, but he hadn't seen her since. The Norfolk's manager thanked him and said he would phone the police. The Tollard's manager, a Mr. Ralph, located Group Captain Brooke and asked him if it had been Marshall that he had dined with on the night of the 3rd. Rupert said no, and that it was someone else that he had known for some time. Mr. Ralph told him about his conversation with the Norfolk's manager and that the police were being contacted and suggested that Brooke might call the police and clear up the matter. Rupert agreed and phoned Detective Constable George Souter, who requested that Brooke come to the station and give a statement. Seemingly awash with overconfidence, the murderous grifter agreed and met him there. This proved to be the beginning of the end for Neville Heath. He calmly conversed with the detective and other officers, stating that the woman he had dinner with was not Doreen Marshall. But after being shown Miss Marshall's picture, he stated that the woman in the picture was the woman that he had dinner with, but he kept insisting her name was not Doreen Marshall. Heath also said that the last time he saw the woman in question, he had walked with her most of the way to the Norfolk Hotel. Souter and the other detectives present were uncertain of Rupert Brooke. To them, he looked familiar. Souter attempted a ruse. Isn't your name Heath? Certainly not, the group captain replied. Souter stated that Brooke looked quite a lot like the pictures in the newspapers regarding the Marjorie Gardner murder. I suppose I do. People have commented on it. This was a clear mistake by Neville Heath. He had been unaware that his picture had never actually been circulated in the newspapers, but it had been heavily shared amongst law enforcement in the area. Though Heath insisted that Souter had it wrong when he asked to be allowed to return to the Tollard for his coat, he was detained at the station. Officers were sent to his hotel room and they grabbed his coat and they found something interesting in the pocket, a claim ticket for the cloakroom at the Bournemouth railway station and a single white pearl. Officers went to the station and using the claim ticket retrieved a suitcase in it was a riding crop with a diamond weave pattern in the handle, as well as clothes with the name Heath written on the labels. There was also a hat and scarf with blood on them. When Souter brought the suitcase and its contents to the supposed group captain Rupert Brooke, the man knew the game was up. He admitted that he was Neville Heath, and he was arrested. Heath was handed over to London police, who formally charged him with the murder of Marjorie Gardner, they could not yet charge him with the murder of Doreen Marshall because she hadn't been found, but police felt certain that she was another victim of Heath. On July 7th, a woman named Kathleen Evans had been walking her dog along a trail in Branksome Park near Bournemouth when they encountered a mass gathering of flies. 
Kathleen left the area and later told her father what she had seen. Curious, the two of them decided to go back to check into it, and together they encountered a horrific sight. They found the body of Doreen Marshall, naked save for one shoe, and mutilated by a knife. It was clear that she had tried to defend herself. She had several defensive wounds and cuts on her hands. Lying about her body were white pearls, the remains of a necklace. Charges of Doreen's murder were added to Neville Heath's case, but the prosecution focused on the death of Marjorie. In a rare attack of terminal truthiness, Neville confessed to everything and told his lawyer, J.D. Caswell, that he was to enter the plea of guilty. Caswell informed Heath that it was certain death to do so and that he could plead insanity. Heath agreed and the defense was attempted. However, two doctors determined that he was not insane and he did indeed know what he was doing at the time. Neville Heath was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging at Pentonville Prison in northern London, an execution that was carried out the morning of October 16, 1946. When the prison governor offered Heath a glass of whiskey, which was the custom at the time, he replied, while you're at it, sir, you might make that a double. Neville Heath never expressed remorse during his trial or execution, yet in a letter that he had written to his parents just a short time before his hanging, he wrote, my only regret at leaving the world is that I've been damned unworthy of you both. What was it about Neville Heath that made him such a monster? How could he function with such evil yearnings and yet maintain enough discipline to become a pilot in two air forces? Did the death of his baby brother shatter him so badly that it left deep mental scars? Or was the general lack of accountability for his actions and having a talent for talking his way out of situations more to blame? In a time of world war, how likely is it that Neville actually committed more murders? Could there be a trail of victims? unsolved murder cases to this day obscured by the war that raged on at the time. Whatever his reasons, the truth in Neville Heath died with him and will remain seriously mysterious. If you're enjoying this show, please check out Seriously Mysterious, the podcast. We have over 150 episodes waiting for you.